One of the important things of, uh, about looking for samples in a cave is that many of the features are rather subtle, but once you actually learn to see them, you can pick this pattern out as you go through a cave. So I'm standing by an example here, which shows a couple of different really important features. One is that there are shiny colonies that are growing on the walls. And these are, in this case, a contrasting color to the wall. So this shows that there are colonies of microorganisms growing in those particular environments. The second feature that we see here is all of these sort of complicated, convoluted maze-like patterns. And those patterns are interesting also because that is a pattern of microbial growth on the wall. So as you travel through a cave, it's important to be aware of these subtle patterns that you see as you, as you move through the passage. One of the important things to prepare yourself as you go through a cave to figure out where to look, where organism colonies may be the most uh, abundant and reachable, is to really think about the geology as you go through and think about the actual shape of the cave. So in places that have sort of low overhangs, like where I'm standing here, very often this is a place where air is compressed as it goes through the cave. And this is a place where moisture condenses out. And many of the organisms are waiting for that moisture to be delivered in order to grow. So these are places where you can actually see them. It's also a place where the organisms uh, tend to precipitate or help to precipitate uh, the presence of minerals that grow on or around them. And so both of those kinds of features often uh, occur together. And so that's one place to look. A second place to look, of course, is where there are bodies of water. So if there are small pools within caves, then you can see sometimes active growth, or you can see in ancient pools and caves, those would be places to actually look for samples that may have microfossils in them. One of the important uh, indicators of potential microbial growth is color. So many organisms are white when they grow in a cave, uh, but many others have an array of beautiful colors from yellow, um, kind of an off-white, uh, gold, orange, red, even blue and green, or purple. And some caves have even a gray, shiny appearance uh, to them. And so, for example, this feature that I'm standing under here has a number of what we call actinobacterial colonies. And these tiny little colonies have a beautiful golden uh, color in this particular cave. Other caves may have other colors. So what one is really looking for is contrast in color or texture or a degree of vertical development somehow uh, coming out from the surface of the rock. So texture is another aspect that's really important. These so-called biovermiculations that we see here is a, an example of a large-scale texture. But some textures are very, very fine. They can be wrinkly or they can have tiny little um, prominences that come up in the texture. So really the message is anything that stands out from the background of the cave may be of significance. And those are places where you should stop, you should look, sometimes using a hand lens where you can actually look um, and see even a slightly magnified version can help you decide whether this is a particular place that you want to sample. I'm taking an ordinary lighter and an ordinary field knife, one of the blades, and burning off any residual microorganisms or organic material that might be on there. This is a rather crude method of taking samples in the field, but it's very effective. Because we're looking for microorganisms that uh, use rather specific and unusual nutrient sources, like metals or other minerals, um, we are less concerned about contamination than we would be if we were studying bacteria that are more used to high levels of organic material. So I do this a series of three times for a number of seconds. 
because there are some organisms that are quite heat resistant and in a very uh, dormant form called a spore or a cyst. And I want to make sure that I get those guys too and get everybody off the surface that I'm going to use uh, to actually scrape the sample or dig the sample or even sometimes flick the sample uh, off the surface. So one more time to just make sure we've got everybody gone and then we'll go ahead and we'll take some samples of these actinobacterial colonies and the biovermiculation patterns. Okay. All right, Ilana, if you will, uh, let's see, I'm gonna get into position and uh, scrape some of the material. If you can give me one of these one at a time. And what I will do is put my little finger here because the inside of this container is sterile, that it has been sterilized. And we wanna make sure that only the material we're interested in up on the ceiling here goes actually into the tube. So the usual method for doing this is to clutch it with one hand and then actually unscrew it with the other hand. Keep that clutched in the little finger while you have the knife in the same hand and then you go towards the sample and we actually take a small portion of this material. We try to scrape it off. So I've got tiny little crumbs. You usually don't need a lot. And then I'm just dumping that into the sterile container. So I've got a sterile knife and I've got a sterile container. So that's why I'm trying to harvest this material. Now, if you look at the tip of the knife, you can see that there's quite a bit of brown material on there, or grayish brown material. That is microbial mat and mineral deposit, and the gooey material that bacteria produce called biofilm. So all of that's going into this sample. Now, this sample will be prepared, and you can barely see it in there, will be prepared for scanning electron microscopy when I get it back to the lab. But the next sample that we're going to take is one to actually grow the organism. So I don't have to re-sterilize right now because I haven't touched this to anything except the surface that I'm examining or want to examine. So I can go ahead and do a second sampling here. And this particular tube has uh, a gel-like material in it, which is used for growing bacteria. And this has a number of different nutrients in it. And we prepare these with different kinds of nutrients so that we can hope to provide the organisms with at least some food that they like. So I'm gonna go ahead and lift this up here. And let's see, we've got some of the same kind of material right here. So I'm gonna scrape this scrape this gooey material here and get as much of it as I can. So I've got a nice big chunk on the end of my knife. And then I'm gonna move this back down and I'm going to insert this into the tube, scrape it off on the edge without touching anything, close it up, and then actually tap the tube until I can get that material down into it. I'm going to give this to Alana so she can hold it and then hope to bash this material down. Sometimes you have to get really stern with it so that it will go down there. Okay, now you can see that that material that I got is now on this slanted surface of the medium. And so whatever organisms that are contained in that material will immediately think, hmm, I'm in a different environment, what will I do? And some of them will like what I've provided as a menu and some will not. So this is why we use many different kinds of uh, media in order to try to entice somebody to grow on these. And once we do, then of course we can take those um, back out again and make new cultures in the laboratory. We can work with those organisms. We can test them in many different ways. We can look at them. We can subject them to chemical tests and so forth. So this is really being a zookeeper, going out into nature and trying to capture uh, microorganisms to bring them back so that we can study them. So we are going to take another sample here of this tiny little drop up here that has some golden colonies around it. 
and it has moisture. And so that's why it's a juicy spot for us to try to capture. I believe that there are actinobacteria in this deposit. And so the medium that I have prepared for this is specifically to try to isolate those kinds of organisms. So this is the one that we're going to use. So here again, I put my little finger on the cap and I have pre-sterilized my knife. And we're going to go move the whole shebang up there and then go after that tiny little drop. And I'm actually going to touch the drop to the rim to capture the water. And then I'm going to go in and try to take small particles. Put them on the inside of the rim. Tap them to go down onto the medium. Take another tiny sample here. Even though the amount that we are sampling is very small, it is going to contain a very large number of microorganisms. So the sample does not have to be large. And so I tap it and everybody jumps in there and then we recap it. And there we are. I'm standing in front of some white material here that you can see on the walls. And this is an interesting kind of microbial deposit because um, when you first look at it, it doesn't really look like it's the product of life. But what is happening here with this material, which is called moon milk, is that microorganisms living in small fractures within the bedrock are putting out acids as a byproduct of their life processes, and those acids are helping to break down the bedrock. When that mineral material in the bedrock is actually put into a more soluble form, it then starts to precipitate out again, but this time on the filaments and the cell bodies of the microorganisms themselves, and even on the, uh, the biofilm, this gooey material that they make. And so in some places you see fairly thin coatings of this white material. If I were to stick my finger in there, it would actually go in quite a distance because this is very mushy stuff. In some caves we find very active moon milk that's still growing with microorganisms. In some caves we actually have preserved moon milk that preserves the microbial bodies very well. So this is another kind of indicator of microbial activity in caves. Some have very, very tiny, thin coatings, and in some places in the world, perhaps there's even a meter deep uh, depth of this material where the bedrock has been altered.